President of the State of Israel, Mr. Shimon Peres. Mr. President, in spite of the worst, the worst weather in Israel for the last 75 years, we have a full house, and all of them are very anxious to hear what you have to tell us. So first of all, I want to thank you for being already the fifth time in DLD Israel and talking to this group. We have here delegations, I think, from 73 countries. Which countries are you from? <laughs> we have uh, 300 people from France, 150 people from the UK. We have a lot of people from Japan, 100 from Japan, 105 from China, and the list goes on and on and on. We had the Minister of, Econ of Economics of France yesterday. We have the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bavaria, this very nice lady. Raise your hand. Can you please uh, meet here with greetings? <coughs> now, uh, you just came back from uh, a very important think tank in Italy, I think, right? You just attended Ambrosetti. So what are your main take away from that meeting? Well, uh, Europe has now the burning problem, which is refugees. And there are different ideas how to handle it. I was asked too about it. And my answer is like about terror. You cannot end terror just by fighting terrorists. You have to fight the reasons for it. The same is refugees. You cannot handle just the refugees who are flowing in. You have to have a deeper look, see what to do. And the right answer is, instead of bringing to Europe foreign workers, Europe should, and should do it in the future, send work to Africa and the Middle East and other places. The people are flying not because they want to leave their countries, because they don't have what to eat or what to wear. And I think all of us have to create jobs and food so they can really remain at their own places. Thank you, thank you very much. <coughs> I would like to ask you if you would like to share with us your view on the current issues in Israel, how you see them. Well, uh, Concerning the high tech, we are in a very good position. Concerning politics, well, there is a great deal to improve. <laughs> I'm not asking you to elaborate on it. Yes. <laughs> look, uh, let's have a look at the real content of the new age of science and technology. What does it really mean worldwide for you, for us, for everybody? Until now, people were making their living out of the land. And if a country wanted to become great, they took more land 
when you took more land, you won, but somebody else lost. And for that reason, war will go on all the time. The land produced, produced wars, because when you take, you take by force, when you liberate, you liberate by force as well. For the first time, a nation, a people, can become great, not by taking, not by using force, because you can do it by education, promoting your scientific level. You don't create enemies, you don't have to fight, wars are not needed, because anyway, you cannot conquer science by war. You can conquer land by war, but not science. It doesn't mean that science does, doesn't create problems too, it does. Instead of wars, for example, we have terrorists. People of uh, evil intentions. Now, to fight terrorists is a different story because science is neutral. Science doesn't care whom they serve, whether a terrorist or a right person. So while making an opportunity for everybody to win science, we must be careful it will, it will not fall in the hand of evil people. So there is no technology without morality. It goes together and we have to keep on. Israel is a small land we have really very little of anything. But it enables us to become a great country not because we have land, we don't, not because we have water, we don't, not because we have oil, we don't, but because we have people who are devoting their energies and their knowledge to use the resource which is open to all, namely science. We have to have understand also the nature of security and foreign relations today. Science brought an end to borders. Science is borderless. It's really global. The global economy is running our lives, but the global economy doesn't have a global government. A global economy is a set of form, of values, of norms, but nobody is governing it. It's based on freedom. And also, science doesn't care if like there is no Bavarian science, or Israeli science, or Brazil science. Science is without flex. So really we can and should work together. So the separation between politics and science is artificial. You cannot separate. It goes together. It changed the nature of democracy. Today democracy is not just the right to be equal, but the equal right to be different. So equality and differences are on the same level. Now each of us, each of you, we're really made of two parts. We live in a world that was never so global as today, on one hand, but a world which is so individual as today. Each of us would like to be equal, but also to express his own inclinations. And for that reason, again, the problem is no longer of free expression, but of self-expression. About the Middle East, I want to add just one sentence. There are 400 million people in the Middle East, rather poor. Some of them are mistaken, for example, by discriminate women. It's a terrible mistake, because if you discriminate women, you are half a nation. Science calls for everybody to be part of the development. If, you, if the mother is not educated, the children are the victims. But the better news about it is here in the Middle East, in Africa, 60% of the people are below the age of 25. And they already have a different approach Many of them have already smartphones. And I think that's our audience. We have to help them to live the, to divorce the, the old walls and skirmishes of the future and to enter to the opportunities 
uh, sorry, of the past and turn to the opportunities of the future. So when it comes to us or to anybody else, we would like to see our Arab neighbors enjoying the same opportunities we have and there is a reason why it shouldn't. We have really to go for a two-state solution, respect each other and work with each other to give a better life, a better hope to these young people or the majority. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. We have here leaders of the industry from all over the world, including a big group of Israelis who are involved in the internet. If you want to call them for action, how to use the internet to achieve the things, the goals, the purpose that, that you listed, what would you tell them? Well, uh the Arabic language is the fourth largest in the world. But the use of the internet in the Arabic language is only four and a half percent. Now, most of the business there are small business or medium-sized business. If you employ an internet, the efficiency will go up almost by 50% and save them. So we are trying to help to introduce internet, to introduce internet in the Arabic language. And we have a dialogue, we have actually a, an organization of a dialogue through the internet between the young people. Over a million people, young people, are connected by the internet and we are doing whatever we can, can to bring in the internet to their midst. Would you like to react on what uh President Perez said, and yeah, yeah, you, and tell tell us a little bit what the kind of work that you are doing. Please introduce yourself and tell us what you are doing. Sure. Um, good morning, Mr. President. Um, I'm I'm producing a, a, a series called Rebel Music. Uh, which is about young musicians and artists and uh, even young civilians around the world that are using the power of the internet uh, to fight oppression and injustice. And my name is Nusrat Durrani and I'm the general manager of MTV World. Thank you very much. This is very inspiring. We have like two minutes and I would like to offer as usually uh, the floor for questions and answers. We have two, maybe two people. Uh, Nelly, would you like to ask the president something or to give him some good advice? Thank you, your seat. Mr. President, it will be... Can you introduce yourself first? Well, Nelly Cruz, um, I'm a former Vice President of the European Commission. I served two terms in the European Commission as a Commissioner for one term, a competition policy, and the other term, a digital policy. To be quite honest, a digital policy portfolio is the main uh, issue that I think we should all be involved, and I couldn't agree more with your line that we are all equal to be different and that all those social devices are giving great opportunities for everybody, but I wouldn't dare to give you advice. I'm listening to you and I'm highly impressed by what you did do and with the courage you uh, filled in your job and still are filling in your job. Michael. Okay, we are used to these things that instead of addressing... No, no, I, I want to add uh, one thing maybe. Science is not only changing our, us, it's all the time changing themselves. Today I can see three or four innovations in the scientific approach and permit me to mention them briefly. For the first time, science is touching the issue of prediction. We can predict things up to a point. 
In order to do that, we have to have maximum information. To have maximum information is a result of a combination between the human being who has imagination and between the robot who has patience. So together they can collect as much information and if you have, and the amount of information is unlimited. So you can predict and that's what we are now trying to do. The first domain of prediction will be apparently medicine. Here in Israel we collected 4.1 files of every sick person. So we know what happened to him and for the test we may guess what will happen to him. The same goes practically in all other fields. That's number one. Number two, apparently sharing is appearing as a social phenomenon. Namely, instead of owning a house or a car, you'll have the service of a house and a car. It will change the whole assumptions of capitalism. I mean, it will be a service instead of an owner. It's another great change. Then uh, I can see the third change, which is very important, particularly I would like to say it here. You know, they say what is more important, a man or a robot? Well, my answer is there is no robot that produced a human being. There are human beings who produce robots, which means that the human being is superior to the robot. And now people, uh, scientists came to the conclusion we invested so much in the robots, let's now invest in the human being. Why make a better robot before you make a better human being? And, uh, and you know, the, robot, the human being have a long way to go. For example, you don't need any more glasses because you can improve your eyes. You can change, improve your heart, everything. But also, we must understand that the human being is different from a robot because we have feelings, because we have dreams, because we have imagination. It's a mistake to separate the technical capacities of the human being from the extra capacities that he possesses intellectually and morally. And for that reason, science stopped separating between software and hardware. Even economically, if the mood of the people is poor, it's an economic factor. They don't buy. So feelings too is economic. And we have to combine these two to make the human better, to be helped by the robots who never get fatigued, and understand that imagination, dreams, and that's what I recommend. Don't waste too much on remembering. Spend your time on dreaming. The more you dream, the better you will be. And I suggest never be afraid to dream great. If I regret something in my own life, that my dreams that at the time were considered great, today in my eyes they are too small. We should have dreamed greater and larger and listened to each other. And then understand that freedom is not just what you do as a member of the many, but also what you are permitted by the many to do yourself. Because each of us is both part of the whole and yet individual completely. We have the same hands, but there are no two people that have the same fingerprint. When it comes to fingerprint or cancer, we are totally individual. And the individuality is as important as the wholeness. So we have to have a fresh look for the future. Thank you very much. Steffi. Unfortunately, we have to finish very soon. Steffi, are you willing, on behalf of all of us, to wrap up this uh, discussion? This is very difficult because, Mr. President, I'm so touched about what you said. 
It's for us, the dreaming, the vision, the imagination is, I think, the most important, especially here in Israel. It's so important that we never stop dreaming, never stop imagine, work all with, with all power what we have to make the world a better place and have Mr. Paris and Yossi Yu as our role models. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Paris. And see you next year in DLD in Tel Aviv. Thank you very much. Uh, just one moment. I want to give an advice so everybody wants it. And that is how to keep your young spirit. Count your achievements in life. Count your dreams in your mind. If the number of the dreams are larger than the number of achievements, you are young. If you think otherwise, you are old. such a great honor to have our night president Mr. Shimon Perez here with us he really inspires us and we do we are we are really inspired by a great trio that are gonna be here in a minute on any minute on stage uh, a trio that will do a four um, um, somebody is mentioning it we have four this is even much more more better so we are cut quattro so in an inauguration of a great quattro that actually it's a new partnership here in Israel and it will be inaugurated here in DLD Tel Aviv thanks to you Daniel the stage is yours good morning everybody I would like to welcome to the stage for Telco four of the largest telcos and their startup ecosystems director so please may i have the following on stage natalie boulanger startup ecosystem director of orange 